If you have been on any transit system in the world, which I'm sure you have, you will see something called an emergency door release. And they differ quite a lot in terms of shape, size, instructions, and even functionality. For example, in some trains around the world, if you pull the handle or lever, it will stop the train immediately. On some trains, it will stop as long as the train is in stations or the train just keeps going. On some systems, it will activate an intercom with the driver and you can talk to the driver. And then on some, it will stop as long as the train is at low speed. But if the train is at high speed, it doesn't do anything. So I thought it would be valuable if I can give some context to this feature on the train. So the immediate question is, why do we even need emergency door releases? Well, let's accept it. No matter how good the design is, emergencies are inevitable. And and this lets passengers evacuate in cases of emergencies. One of the first examples is that of a medical emergency. Now I understand that the best option would be to just keep going to the next station where emergency responders can attend. But in some scenarios, maybe evacuating the train is the best course of action. Another example, which happens quite a lot, is your train car filling with smoke. Then there could be equipment malfunctions that result in fire. If not equipment malfunctions, you could have an actual person who is committing vandalism or arson that causes it fire. You must be thinking that doesn't happen that often, right? Actually, no. So Bart did a study of all the fire and smoke incidents from 1975 to 1985, a span of 10 years, and it came to the conclusion that there has been 50 one fire and smoke incidents because of equipment malfunction and there are 47 incidents because of vandalism and arsons and that's a big number combined this is almost 100 incidents in 10 years which is almost 10 incidents per year another evolving hazard is that of an active shooter and in that scenario i'm guessing that it's probably safer to evacuate the train than being stuck inside then in case of accidents emergency release can be used to escape the car in case the door remains locked. But regardless of all of these, the popular ones are the fire and smoke related hazards. You look at any stats, for example, I looked at the stat in Europe, and you can see that fire and smoke related incidents, which is shown by dark red, still constitutes some percentage of the total number of incidents. So it will always happen no matter how good the design is. You could also look at fire and smoke incidents that has happened in the past two decades, and you'll find plethora of those. For example, in South Korea in 2003, there was was an incident in Daegu subway that resulted in 191 deaths. This is in Womata in 2015, where all of it was filled with smoke. People had to be evacuated, and it still resulted in one death. In DB ICE in Germany, there was a transformer fail failure, which resulted in a big fire. Then in New York subway, one person died because of vandalism-related fires. So they still always happen. Now you might be wondering, why don't we just have the same feature in all the trains? Let passengers pull the handle and evacuate wherever they want, whenever they want, right? Actually, no, because evacuation anywhere can introduce new sets of safety concerns, new sets of challenges and hazards. And let's look at those. For example, quite a lot of railway systems around the world get their power from third rail. Third rail is basically another rail apart from the two running rails, which have voltages up to 1500 volt. And coming in contact with those rails can literally electrocute you. So you can you look at this video posted on TikTok where a person sitting on the second rail comes in contact with third rail and it gets electrocuted. You can look at evacuation instructions on all of the third rail based metros and light rails. And you will see they'll clearly mention that there is a high voltage third rail and stay clear of it. So evacuations of passengers can be very dangerous in those situations and it should always be done in supervision of a crew member and the crew member will ensure that the third rail is de-energized. Another scenario can be where the line has a lot of bridges or ditches or features which can literally kill you if you evacuate it wherever you want it. Now, the newer tunnels are built according to codes and regulations, but there could still be older tunnels with very limited clearance. There is literally nowhere to walk. So in those scenarios, evacuation is not an option. Similarly, there could be trains built on older infrastructure without any walkways. And in those scenarios too, evacuation is not an option. Then another scenario could be that you have multiple lines next to your line, or even one line is enough to introduce new hazards. For example, this evacuation in Manila, which thankfully was a crude evacuation, but if this evacuation was self-evacuation without any supervision, 
this could have introduced to new hazards because by the time another train on this line saw them, it would have been too late. Another example is that of low floor trains versus high floor trains. So on low floor trains, which is common with light rail and trams, evacuation and deboarding is relatively easy. But on high floor trains, it's very difficult. This picture might not show you the perspective, but this picture shows you that the height of these high floor trains is almost equal to the height of a person. So it's not very easy to just jump off of these trains. Or maybe the geographical conditions are very poor. Maybe there's a cliff on one side. Side, maybe the visibility is poor or this picture that you see is from a real line in England it's called Dawlish line and as you can clearly see evacuation on this line can be also very dangerous so the question is okay fine there's all these hazards but how do they affect the functionality well, let's look at an amalgam of hazards. What if your line has a hazard of third rail? And what if your line also has poor clearance? And what if your line has a high floor train? Well, actually, you don't have to imagine. There's actual lines like that. So London Underground is a perfect example, which has all of these three hazards. How they handle that is if the train is partially within a platform or fully within a platform, then pulling the door handle lever will stop the train immediately. But if the train has left the platform, then pulling the handle will patch you to the driver and driver has the ultimate authority to decide whether to stop and evacuate or whether to keep going to the next station. Another reason why you might see difference in functionality is because of available technology at the time of procurement of trains. You see, trains have evolved over time, as has everything else in your life. There's more electronics on board, there's more advanced tech on board. So with that, the newer trains might have smarter systems compared to old trains, which is exactly the case with New York Metro. On New York Metro, older trains will have emergency door releases that look like this, where if you were to pull the cord, it will immediately stop the train wherever the train is. But on the newer trains, there is something called a PEHU. And if you were to activate that, it works similar to London Underground in that the train will stop as long as the train is within the platform or 600 feet close to the platform. Otherwise, it will just connect you to the train operator and the train keeps running and will come to the stop on next station. So what if your train is on fire, the train has left the station like this, you pull the handle, you're now expecting the driver to respond and you're waiting and waiting and waiting and you don't get any response back because the driver is incapacitated. I agree that all of that happening at the same time is an extremely low probability, but some railways have also included a feature to mitigate that. For example, in Japan, JRE has incorporated something called an override timer. Basically, what that does is that once the door release is activated, it will give the driver a certain time to respond. So in case of JRE, it's 30 seconds. So within those 30 seconds, driver can push the button and override the brake request and speak to the passenger. But in case the driver is incapacitated, then the timer will run out and the train will stop as soon as it runs out. But regardless of all of these scenarios that we can think of and that we can design for, they are still prone to be misused. Internet is full of examples like that. You can see lots of news articles on people misusing emergency door releases. You can see lots of Reddit posts. You can see YouTube, which is full of videos where people just activate these handles and get off of the train wherever they want. Because of all these, some agencies might just choose to fully ditch this option and just give passengers one option, which is talk to the driver. And the full responsibility in those scenarios sits with the driver to stop the train and evacuate or keep running to the next station. And I think that's also a very smart d design. Okay, but we have seen what different approaches are, how different agencies handle this, but are there any regulations or standard? There has to be some sort of standard, right? Explaining how this is done. And yeah, let's look at some of those standards. One of the first ones that we'll look at is TSI, which is Technical Specification for Interoperability. This one is mandated by EU, and this basically applies to all of the trains that are interoperable in Europe, meaning the trains that run from one country to another. And those trains have to adhere to these regulations. And the regulations state that each door shall be provided with an internal emergency opening device. The device shall be active when the speed is below 10 kilometers per hour or 6.25 miles 
miles per hour. That means that on a train like DB ICE, Intercity Express in Germany, which services all of these routes, this handle might be active and it will stop the train if the speed is below 10 kilometers per hour. But if the speed is above, it will not stop the train. Instead, it will patch you with the driver. Just like TSI was applicable to interoperable trains, there are also EN standards which are applicable to trains within Europe and within a country. And these apply to different types of metros, light rails, trams, and urban rail. And this standard has become so popular that it is also being followed in different parts of the world. So what does this standard say? Well, what the standard says is that the door opening may be prevented based on different conditions. And the conditions can be speed, position, and sight. And these are just examples, which means there can be more conditions. So an example of that is London Underground, where position is being used as a factor, meaning if the train is within the station, it will stop the train. If the train has left the station, it will not stop the train and it will patch you to the driver. Same way, speed can be used as a factor, where if the train is below or above a certain speed, for example, in on TSI specs, we saw 10 kilometers per hour, same way, maybe side of the vehicle can be used. So in short, what it says is that it gives you a lot of leeway to use different variables to activate or deactivate the emergency door release feature. Actually, I also found an accident investigation report. The reason why I show this report is that the report says the way London Underground's emergency door release feature works is because the principle underpinning the system is that emergency is best dealt with in a station. So that explains to you the logic behind the way they have designed their emergency door release. I'll digress here a little bit only because we are on that EN standard 14752. Why I digress is because that standard is also prescriptive enough to recommend the location of emergency door release devices. The location has been chosen with accessibility in mind and what the standard says is that the recommended locations are around the doors or on this location in vestibule. Vestibule is when you cross from one train to another. That's why in most of the trains you take, you will see door releases being either next to the door or next to the vestibule. Now that was on European side. Let's also look at standards on the American side. There are two main standards, CFR and APTA. Well, CFR is pretty straightforward. The picture here is from CFR and CFR says that manual override devices shall be provided. They should be capable of releasing the door located adjacent to the door and be readily accessible. Not much going on there, very straightforward. But but APTA goes into a lot more detail. And why I like APTA standard is because it also explains the philosophy. The philosophy of APTA is that every agency shall conduct a hazard assessment and then they should assess risks that are peculiar to their own specific environment. And then based on that hazard assessment, they should determine an acceptable method. So APTA is basically saying that conduct a hazard assessment, see what your safety targets are, see what your availability targets are, and maybe there's peculiar threats in your operating environment. So look at all of those and then design your own emergency door release feature. And then it gives examples. So it's saying one of the design could be where you activate the handle and it will open the door while the train is in motion. Then on the second one, it says, well, you activate the handle, wait for the train to stop and then open the door. Or in the third one, they say that you can just activate the handle and that allows you to speak to the operator and then operator determines a safe location for emergency stopping. So HAPTA has given a lot of leeway to the operators. Now we know what different standards say. Now we know different approaches, different hazards. But is there any way to determine how many exits do I need? Do I need one door, one window? Do I need two doors and two windows? Or do I need a roof hatch? Can I, is there some way I can determine that? Actually, yes, APTA and EN standards both go into a little bit of detail. APTA is actually way more prescriptive. So we'll start with that. APTA basically assigns a value to different types of emergency exits. It assigns four points to the door, 
being used as emergency exits. It assigns 1.2 windows. So same way it assigns different scoring. I won't go into the weeds of it, but basically APTA is saying that you need to meet or exceed a certain value, which in this case is CXF. And this value is based on the capacity of the train. So what it's saying is that if your train car can carry 100 passengers, then you need to have more exits. If your train car has 50 passengers, you can have fewer exits. Similarly, EN standard also says that for a normal payload of 40 passengers, you can have two exits. For a payload of more than 40 passengers, you should have three exits. In short, what I'm trying to say is that the number of exits are dependent on how many passengers you're carrying. APTA says that it gets this number from something they call a reasonable exit rate and they assign a value of 35 people per minute to this reasonable exit rate and they say that they got this number from BART C car report so I looked at this report and I wanted to understand why does this where does this number 35 come from can it be 50 can it be 100 and what the report does is that it did a thorough assessment of every single component on the train so there's technical components like motors inverters batteries. It also looks at furniture components like doors, seats, carpets, windows. And then it evaluated every single component's flammability using a mix of full-scale tests and analysis. And once it's completed the analysis, it determined that BART's choke point, which is in Berkeley Tunnel, that choke point can only accommodate an evacuation rate of 35 passengers per minute. Therefore, BART cars have to be designed. Each fire hazard has to be assessed and the hazard has to be either eliminated or minimized such that when the car is on fire, the heat release is slow enough so that passengers can evacuate safely before heat rises to catastrophic levels. So the 35 number comes from the fact that they want passengers to evacuate quickly enough before the heat of the car rises to catastrophic levels. That's where number 35 comes from. And now that could be different from one network to another network. So door release mechanisms have evolved over time and they are really just a product of a series of solving problems and innovation. So then let's do a recap of where it started from and where we are today and then maybe see where we can go in the future. Now the first one was a very rudimentary way of activating door release. These cords or levers would directly vent the train brake pipe and that venting of brake pipe will apply brakes on the wheels. Now it worked perfectly except the problem was that the driver had to work the entire length of the train looking for some sort of valve to see on which car the door release had been activated and then enter the car and then after entering the car see which exact door release had been activated then investigate and after investigation the driver had to reset the valve. First of all, all of this took a lot of time and effort. And another problem was that this was also prone to more risk. So one of the examples of that is the Gare de Lyon rail accident in France, where a passenger pulled the door handle release and then exited the train and then the operator tried to reset the valve but somehow made a mistake with that and because of that the train was not able to stop when it was heading into the platform and it ran into the train in front and then 56 people died so the older systems they worked as design but they were a lot more problematic it took long for the driver to investigate and also there were problems with resetting then came improved designs that look more like this. With improved designs, there were more electronics and electrical circuits on the board. Instead of the handle directly venting the, dra the brake pipe, instead it inter interacted with an electrical circuit. The electrical circuit would then de-energize when you would pull the handle and that de-energization would then actuate the brake valve which will then apply the brakes. Also, now there were new electrical and electronic technologies because of which the operator on its screen could see exactly which door handle was pulled and with even newer technologies where you have CCTVs, 
the operator could also see exactly what was going on in the cab. So the systems became a bit more evolved. It was still being misused. So with the misuse, there were different techniques to prevent misuse. One of the techniques was use a glass and plastic cover or something that they have on Japanese bullet trains is that they have a cover on top, which is locked by solenoid. And this cover remains locked when the speed is above 30 kilometers per hour or 18.6 miles per hour. But if the speed is below 30 kilometers per hour, the cover can be unlocked and the emergency door handle can be activated. Then came more intelligent systems where you could use variables like speed and location to activate or deactivate the door release. For example, now when you pull the door release, it will not apply the brakes and it will instead be tied to the variables. So like variables like speed and location, it will look at those before it would activate the brakes. So this system started getting more and more intelligent by incorporating more and more variables into the feature. Then there was addition of an override timer, which was able to mitigate the one-off scenario of driver incapacitation. It's still a low probability event, but it's still very valuable. So that's sort of where we are today. But with advancement of technologies, I do see this feature evolving to address more and more hazards. I was trying to think hard about examples. And one of the examples I can think of is this. So let's say you are outside the platform, you pull the handle and the driver in, is incapacitated, the timer runs out, the train has come to a stop and now you're finally evacuating. Maybe there could be a zone on the adjacent lines where the movement of the trains can be blocked so the other trains cannot move past this zone. And maybe doors of only one side are released and the doors of other side are still not released because there could be a hazard on that side, such as third rail or cliff or ditch. So what I'm trying to say is that in future, I see systems getting smarter and incorporating more and more variables. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope I was able to provide you with some context. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in the next one.